Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Noli Hewitt and Das. I'm a professor of innovation management and policy, uh, and I'm also Pro Vice Chancellor of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all this evening to the annual KPMG lecture with Sir Tim Smith. In association with the Chief Executives Club and also with Queen's Management School. KPMG has been a valued partner for the university for many years, working extremely closely, in particular with the management school and also with our student internship and placement offices. And partnerships such as that are, are critical to the success of our students in the university, but also to our local economy as a whole. And we look forward to many more years of a fruitful relationship with KPMG. Of course, I would like to extend a very special welcome to our guest speaker this evening. How honoured we are to have him with us. Sir Tim Smith, KBE, co-founder of the Eden Project, will deliver this year's keynote address, Does Salvation from Climate Change Rely on the Moral Compass of the Corporate World? As COP26 comes to a close, Queen's has committed to doing all that we can as a university and a community to play our part in tackling the global climate emergency. We will build on our success to date in tackling climate change and as a major civic university, we will develop a plan to enable us to continue on our journey towards reaching net zero carbon emissions as soon as possible. Queen's is a world leader in research and we believe that by helping our talent to look for solutions that, that can have real impact. And we will work in collaboration with other universities and business and government at pace to deliver solutions for a more sustainable world. Tim, you've been quoted recently as saying that you truly believe that by working together in revolutionary interdisciplinary ways we can create emergence and at Queen's we echo those sentiments. One of the examples of collaborative excellence recently has been the WTEC Centre at Queen's. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a collaboration between the university and rights and this has enabled us to push forward new zero emission technologies in our public transport sector something which is having a real impact on our local community. Queen's is also delighted to be, have been successful in two very recent projects totaling over one million pounds, funded by the UK government's Community Renewal Fund. These projects will facilitate the transition to net zero through the creation of a new hydrogen training academy and also supporting entrepreneurial activity across Northern Ireland, which will engage industry, government, academia, and also working, of course, with the community in the design of novel zero carbon cooperatives. The Hydrogen Academy will be the first of its kind in Northern Ireland and will develop a dynamic skilled workforce that can take full advantage of hydrogen and clean tech opportunities. It will be led by Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, home to the production of the hydrogen buses, which were designed in partnership with Queen's. All these projects build on that heritage of innovation and a passion to support green growth. Our academics and students are passionate about sustainability and very much the need to be working together. Earlier this week, the Irish Taoiseach and the Deputy First Minister launched the All Island Climate and Biodiversity Research Network, bringing together experts from multiple disciplines across the island to undertake the research necessary to address the climate and biodiversity emergencies. And now a little bit about our speaker, who really needs little introduction. Tim was born in Holland and read archaeology and anthropology at Durham University. Having worked in the music industry for 10 years, in 1987 he moved to Cornwall where he and John Nelson together discovered and then restored the lost gardens of Heligan. 
Tim is Executive Vice Chair and co-founder of the award-winning Eden Project near St. Austell in Cornwall. Eden began as a dream in 1995, but quickly moved from a dream and opened its doors to the public in 2000. Since then, more than 19 million people have visited. They've been able to see what was once a sterile pit turned into a cradle of life with world-class horticulture and startling architecture. Tim is a trustee, patron and board member of a number of statutory and voluntary bodies, both locally and nationally, and has received a variety of national awards. In 2002, he was awarded an honorary CBE in the New Year Honours List, and in June 2012, he was appointed Knight Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, KBE, KBE by Her Majesty the Queen. A great friend to Queen's University, we're delighted that Tim took the time to meet with our students in an unplugged student-only session this afternoon, which I am told was a great success and thoroughly enjoyed by the students. Tim has also worked with my colleagues here and across Northern Ireland for a number of years on his vision for a mini Eden in the Northwest. The possibility of creating an Eden spin-off in Northern Ireland is hugely positive and exciting for us all. It has so many potential benefits, not only to the local economy, but to culture, education, communities and tourism. Sir Tim is well known for mobilizing people and energy, and that's the story of Eden. Let's hope it can have the same transformative effect here in Northern Ireland. So Tim, as you announce your most recent Eden project on the Amazon borders in southern Colombia, we hope that in the not too distant future, Northern Ireland will join your inspirational list of new Edens right across the world. So without further ado, I will now pass you over to Sir Tim Smith to deliver tonight's keynote address does salvation from climate change rely on the moral compass of the corporate world? Tim. Hello, everybody. How nice it is to see so many familiar and friendly faces. The choice was either the title that I am speaking about or the history of English boilers between 1737 and 1845, in, uh, concentrating on the tubular duplex boiler, which is a particular favorite of mine. Your call, what do you want? Okay. I am gonna talk about corporate um, responsibility and the moral compass is necessary, but I want to start by telling you something really important about my grandson, Luca. I was swearing at a bunch of Americans last night who want us to build a climate change center in the middle of Manhattan multi, multi hundred millions of dollars. And I got really, really angry with them. And I said to them, would you like me to bring my grandson upstairs to participate in this Zoom? I said, you tossers, Americans didn't understand that word, but I said, you tossers are talking about university style timescales. Let's take 20 years to do this, a bit more research to do that, put my nose in the trough over here. My grandson, is the, is the son of the climate change minister for the Maldives, who's my daughter-in-law. In the 20 years' time that they were thinking about getting all this research together and poncing about and doing stuff, it won't exist. I started my conversation today with the students with this assertion. We, me included, all of us are climate change deniers. How can we be anything but that? If we believe what we read, if we believe what happens at COP, what are we doing? Why would you not be changing really radically the way you operate, whether you're a business or whether you're a university? If you believe it, which I do, I think we are under great threat. I think we're under great opportunity as well. And that's what I want to talk about, the opportunity, because the threat I'm taking is a given. And what can we do within that Eden, as, as, as you kindly said, we're trying to build Edens uh, on every inhabited continent of the world. Um, and actually, we've now contracted to already do that. We were going to be doing it by 2025, but 
countries all over the world are starting to feel actually there's a change, there's a change in mood. I just come back from COP and what was very interesting was people said when I got back to Eden, well, what did you make a COP? And I said it was very interesting, it's very interesting. The cheap shot is to say blah, 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 you know. But actually, what is really interesting is on the one side you have politicians who feel actually powerless but have to look and make big, you know, statements. But what was going on backstage, especially uh, with the Sustainable Markets Initiative, is that the men and women who lead, let's say, the top 100 companies in the world today were talking in a way that I've never heard them talk before. I don't know whether it's the effect of being locked with their children over the pandemic or whether it's actually because of a huge corporate repositioning. But they were all talking about the fact that ESG is already old fashioned. It's a bit as if, as if you have to talk about it. It means, you know, it's like Tony Blair talking about Cool Britannia. If you mention it, you're not. And I was fascinated by the fact that the, the, big, the big corporates who were there were all talking about the speed with which um, they see the, the, the future coming at us. I smile at it because I think they're typical middle-aged men who always get it wrong. I think the speed of change is coming unbelievably fast and that within 15 years, the world that we know will just not exist. I think the changes that are coming over the next short while are going to be similar to the changes between, say, 1910 and 1925. The changes really from the 60s to today are quite trivial in terms of the way we live and we've still got planes, we've still got cars, whatever. So if I may, I'd like to just rock through where I think the changes are being from what I've seen. And I shall start with the Eden Project in Cornwall. Ten years ago, we were told by big oil that we couldn't do what we wanted to do. We couldn't do deep, deep geothermal. It wasn't going to be economically viable. It was going to be risky. As I speak to you today, our drills are at 5,380 meters below ground. The temperature we are hitting there is 187 degrees centigrade. We're going to be bringing up enough heat and power from our pipes going deep underground to mean that if every one of our 1.1 million visitors every year came from Venus, they would still be carbon positive. When you put the solar across our car parks, the amount of power that Eden is generating will give heat and power to a minimum of 35,000 properties next to us. It will generate all the energy that we need for our research greenhouses. It will help us to develop novel crops. It will help us produce algae. It will help us produce large seaweed beds. But the really interesting thing about this is when we had the G7 at Eden, this sounds like a cheap shot, but you would be shocked at the level of ignorance amongst those supposed world leaders. Far too close a relationship with big oil, which has meant that their positioning has been always skewed towards the side of big oil. When we started our project uh, in 2010, uh, just before the Labour uh, uh, Party were voted out, we went to DEC to see them. You would not believe this, right? This is a Labour Party at the time. The majority of staff in DEC were interns from the oil companies. How on earth is our nation supposed to be informed properly about the choices that face it? I was, I don't know whether you use the word fortunate enough, I spent about half an hour talking to our Prime Minister who knew nothing about geothermal and I explained to him why was he listening to people who were saying it was a problem, that we needed nuclear, that we needed this and we needed that. I said, I promise you, with this technology, Britain, the whole of the British Isles, could be completely renewably powered by the year 2030. 2030. So why is it that the IPCC says this is only possible by the year 2100? Just ask yourself these questions. What I said to the young people that I was privileged to talk to today is for God's sake, when you've been through Queens, the one thing you need to be able to do is to look into the mirror and know that you have learned how to question and you've learned how to think. 
Because what the world is really short of is people who are smart enough to ask the right questions. And where the world is going is to a world of systems, interlocking systems, always systems. And we're going to be coming out of the old university manner of silos here, silos there, silos over the other. We kind of sleek over it by talking about interdisciplinary study. That shows just how close we are to the natural philosophy of the past. It still is a bunch of academics fighting turf wars. Transdisciplinary, we're just about getting there, all right? But the world is going to change radically for universities. There's a great piece of, 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 of uh, graffiti as you go, go into Br Bristol, this by T uh, Bristol Temple Mead Station. He said, if you think change is scary, try irrelevance. Think about that. It is very, very interesting. We were talking in the, in, with the students today about my dearest passion for Queens. Do you know what it is? It would be to develop an AI otter. Wouldn't that be cool for us to own an AI otter? And this otter, it would swim up every river. And everybody would suddenly realize this wasn't a joke at all. An AI otter that could actually test the water wherever it was, and it would know which farms were leaking shit into the river, where the drugs were coming from that weren't being filtered. You know what? In two of the most romantic rivers in Britain, the River Wharf and the River Wye, it is more likely if you go swimming in it that you will get a pair of sanitary towns around your gill than it will be that you see a fish. That is how bad our country has become. So where is our anger? Where is it? Where is this treason to the future? I'm not a left winger. I'm not an open-toed sandal, nut-cutlet munching, open-toed bloke. Do I look like that? I'm a capitalist. I'm pro-capital. And what is really interesting is loads of people, more in your generation than mine, sort of oldish but not yet past it, you know, that sort of age, are starting to feel very differently about the world. A conversation of last week, which is very interesting for KPNG, one of the wealthiest legal firms in Europe. I went to talk to them about moral compass. You know what they said? We will fund a class action against the British government and all of the water companies. We will do that. We will put millions into it. You know why? Because we've tested. Everybody who works for our company does not want to be a pig at the trough. They want to be citizens first, not consumers first. And they actually want to fight for things that they know we're just about to lose. And that is the major issue for all of us here. That's why I love Queens, and I've got my mates here, and I promised I wasn't going to be rude about Queens, because I'm not rude about Queens. I just know that the work that we want to do in Derry is important work. And the danger is that people talk about Eden Project as if it's some kind of fancy theme park. We're not a theme park. It's just, have you looked at all the other science centers around the world? Have they had any influence anywhere? Oh, let's talk about climate change, sponsored by BP and Shell and ExxonMobil. You know what I'm saying? If they were nearly as good as they think they are, the world would be a different place. Our duty is to actually be rock and roll science. That's actually what it is. And if you want to, if you want to test that hypothesis, come home with me to the Eden Project, and we will show you scientists doing their best job at interpretation compared to theatricals interpreting the scientist, it's a completely different world. The theatrical can make the person weep at the information that was given to them by the scientist. And that is in part what this relationship between us and Queens is about, is how do we create a sense of filmic theater in all of it. Anyway, we're talking about moral compass. And I want to tell you the world I have seen that when I talk to British government people, I am horrified. Some of you in the audience know this stuff. I know Chris certainly does. But when you look at, say, clean meat, the clean meat thing, you come across your British people. They talk about, oh, miracle meat. You get quite a nice burger. Great. That's really good. That's especially good when it's someone who's uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture saying that. Because what they're doing is looking down their nose. It'll never catch on. The fact that it was worth 1.8 billion pounds last year, clean meat. Think of that, 1.8 billion. This year, it's going to be double. Who is entering the market now? It is the Chinese. Why are they doing it? Because they have built property over almost all their good farmland already. And the farmland they got left, far too much of it is going toward to supplying meat to the middle classes. And they can't afford to do it. They're going to invest monster sums of money 
into creating a culture of sophistication around artificial meat, which will taste every bit as good as the meat we know and love. Believe me, it's happening right now. And if our governments are not aware of it, they are going to see an absolute car crash. But that's nothing compared to what else is going on. Fermentation technology, the speed of the development of fermentation technology is breathtaking. For those of you who don't know what fermentation technology it is, have you ever seen a big tree in a pot? Have you ever asked, why is that big tree in a pot? The actual question is, how is a big tree living in a small pot? That's actually the really intelligent question. Because most people think that trees eat with their roots, don't they? But you know that's not true. They eat a little bit with their roots, but they also eat an awful lot of sunlight. And they also absorb proteins from the air. And amazingly, technology devised in um, Finland, but now being taken on board massively in the west coast of America with fermentation technology, they are producing dairy protein at 30% of the cost of dairy from dairy. And the price is coming down by the quarter. So if you're a strategist for Northern Ireland or Britain, you'll be thinking, heck, won't you? That'd be one of the words that goes across your airspace, heck. So you've got those two technologies coming. You've got electric motors coming. They're already caught on. Many of us were saying three or four years ago that within the next three years, there will be no factories left anywhere in the world producing combustion engines of the normal sort within three to five years. And it's happening all over the place. It's happening, the technological shift. What's that going to mean? We're going to go energy renewable, because I think Eden's trivial, but the point is actually storytelling, isn't it? Once people see that you've actually got this wall of renewables, you're going to, to, to find an energy solution for your nation. You're going to need a farming solution for your nation, which currently the smart money is on regenerative agriculture, seeing agriculture as a mixed agronomy. Uh, we're seeing uh, biodiversity enhancement, biomass enhancement, and of course, carbon sequestration. Why do we talk about carbon sequestration? Because accountants like talking about carbon sequestration and where men and you can add up carbon. So I'm making a long list in my warfare, and I will eventually come to morals. But morals are kind of almost irrelevant if the story that I tell you is how it's going to be. I would bet my house on what I'm telling you. So, when you bear in mind that this revolution to go to renewables is going to see us then not transport huge amounts of container ships around the world, 40% of all the major container ships in the world are taking hydrocarbons around the world. So they will go. That's a shed load of billions of tons of stuff to recycle, isn't it? Then you've got all the lorries that will no longer be needed for coal. So they will be going. Then what comes next? We've done energy. We're doing food. And what's going to happen, and one of the things that I'm so interested in working with Queens on, is I promise you this is coming. Because of the pandemic, a lot of people realize they want to work where they live. And a lot of farmers have been hooked into big agriculture for an awful long time and have not known how to get out of it. My proposition to you is that within 15 years, almost all towns and cities will have reorganized the agriculture around them so that actually, with renewable energy able to provide extra heat, to, for example, like we're doing at Eden with, with modernized uh, polytunnels, we can produce anything we like and it'll be really cheap. So imagine you have the concept of the word supermarket, and around Derry, and around Belfast, and around every town across Northern Ireland. You create cooperatives of the farms. In case you doubt me, a lot of people are getting really interested in this, which then means that if you're, a, if you're in charge of business strategy for Ireland, you would then want to make sure that all the processing equipment to be able to get the finished product done is brilliantly located. The internet. Funny thing, isn't it, that we've got our gripes with it. We have all see the evils of it. But basically, it's like having an annoying adolescent at home. 
The th last thing I want to say before I talk about moral compass is about trees. And I want to talk to you about trees because I love trees. He's going to go hippie, they think. He's going to go hippie. No, no, no. Hold it, hold it, hold it. No, no. I love trees, you know, because you know what trees do just before they die? They do efflorescence. They flower like never before because they fear death. They know they're going. It's all over. The flowers come out. Has it not occurred to you as you look around the world and you saw Donald Trump and Bolsonaro and Orban and the guys in Burma, all these guys with the right-wing centrist technique, ta tactics, they're all dying like those old trees. That's why it's so exciting to come to Queens and meet all those youngsters. They're not going to put up with that shit. They're just not. The pandemic has shown them a world which has not got national boundaries in the way that we've come to see them. Lord knows we're in a country which has fought long and hard over boundaries here, boundaries there. It's going to go. Once you've got localized farming, but it's muscular localized farming, localized energy, everything is based around a diffused center. There is no reason for a central democratic institution. There's no reason for it. Because actually we will be skilling up people who are in these provincial places. I'm saying this because one of the conversations we had today was about the future role of, say, Queen, what roles are there that are coming that no one has seen? I think one of the great roles within, say, the business school and within the social sciences is how do you prepare the people who live in a country to actually genuinely take agency in terms of how they organize themselves? Because Lord knows if Northern Ireland is anything like Cornwall, in Cornwall, in Cornwall there's a budget of somewhere short of a, a, a small multinational being managed and overseen by people, you know, some people being pig farmers and uh, minor occupations. That's not a put down, it's just that they have not been trained to actually manage huge sums of money and to look after health systems in a proper way. So, where does that moral compass come in? I think the next 20 years are going to be utterly, utterly amazing. Imagine all of you who are old enough to remember the 1960s. We are stardust. Do you remember all that? All that hippie stuff? We're living at a time when the sciences have revealed that the mycorrhizal associations in the soil, that the human biome inside us are very closely related. We are earthlings. At a time of a more secular approach to the world, certainly, well, almost everywhere except here, um, uh, it, it is, it, so that was a, ch ch I didn't mean that. <laughs> um, uh, that actually we're going to have this extraordinary revelation of, of how we are related in a kind of spiritual way to the, to the natural world. The Eden Project, which is why I'm standing here in front of you, we have got projects all over the world, and I just want to explain why. Um, with this moral compass that I was going to talk about, I will mention it, of course, moral compass. It has a very important moral compass. You should have one. Um, is, is we're working in um, Australia with the indigenous people, the Wadawarung, and they are leading our project. We're working in Christchurch in the bend in the River Avon with the Maori Iwi people. You know what's really funny when you, I'm an anthropologist by background, it's really odd how with every passing year of my life, the things I studied as a teenager into my early 20s seem to become more and more relevant as if I was meant to study those things for the final part of my life. Well, I hope this isn't quite the final part of my life, but, um, but what is astonishing, and I would really urge you to do, is, is the, the best book I have read in five years is a book called Dark Emu by a guy called Bruce Pascoe which is the true story of what the British colonists found in Australia before the colonial office forced and redacted what had been sent, right? What the Australians, actually, the British obviously, but have been suppressing all that time was that the Aboriginal peoples, the traditional owners, had villages of 7,000 odd people at a time. They had a really sophisticated series of fish traps that went up every river in Australia. 
They had feasts that lasted for a month. More important than that is the description of Van Diemen's Land, a famous desert, isn't it? It was the biggest prairie of grain probably in the world at that time. They had mastered the art of making plates of clay which were buried in the sand to capture the nighttime dew in the desert and was growing grain. Their storehouses were full. They grew over a hundred different crops. Why am I saying this? It's really interesting what we want to do in Derry, for example, is explore from the pollen uh, records and everything else. What what has happened to our brains that we allowed other people to take over the control of, say, agriculture in such a way that we don't actually know what might actually work properly here? A really good example, I have a friend who has a small farm, and she had an idea that she wanted to grow the old varieties of grain, you know, 10,000 years old, 5,000 years old. She can't get enough of it. The demand for it has gone through the roof, so she's built herself a mill and she's got other people now growing it. You know a lot about that stuff here, don't you? Because you know a lot about this stuff. Why is it so popular? It's so popular because the modern varieties of wheat, to get them like they are on their rootstock, require, makes them very gluten heavy. So there's a monster demand out there for stuff we could be growing here. We could create markets that would make every farm viable if they weren't forced to just all grow the same thing without creating added value, without actually being medically, medically un well-being. I don't know what the phrase is, so forgive me. I'll, I'll just move on. It's, it's a sort of passing thing. The, the, the reason that Eden is interested in working with indigenous people is I think it's a really interesting question, and it's one that Chris and I, this Chris over here, have talked about before, is what is it to be indigenous ourselves? What is it? What, what, what is the nature of how we are, who we are? And is there a complete new revisiting of it? I would like to think our partnership with Queen's is feral rock and roll. I really do. I'm not really very interested in talking to councils and all of that sort of stuff. We have to do it. It's part of the game. I'm really interested in putting the best engineers in the university with the best social scientists, with the medical people, whatever. And we'll build that damned otter. We'll build that AI otter and we will go up every river in Ireland and there will be a demand if every country in the world will want that technology, why the hell aren't we doing it? You know, the Environment Agency cannot monitor our rivers in Britain. One of my colleagues was the chief scientist for the Environment Agency. He said it's heartbreaking. He said when you know that, you may not like this, but if you know that um, every day four and a half million people with Alzheimer's are peeing into your river, God knows how many people have got other drugs going to the river. There are no filters. None. What are we doing? Why are we allowing private companies to do all that stuff? Remember, I'm a capitalist. But why are we allowing private companies to pollute our birthright going forward? I doubt there's a single person in this room does not think that it would be really, really exciting to put together like a, a, a hit squad in the university of people right across departments, and it would be the department of the national interest it wouldn't have some poncy phrase like the Climate Change Control Center. I'm, I'm sorry, I just get bored with it because it's the same sort of thing as people who talk about centers of excellence and you know, uh, being leading edge, bleeding edge, cutting edge. We're thinking out of the box. We're doing joined up thinking and we're also thinking the unthinkable. The one thing I can tell you for free is that every organization in the world that uses those phrases is that in inverse proportion. It may sound cruel for all of you who do use those phrases, but for, for God's sake, stop it. No, because it's like a kid whistling to stop their toes being bitten by a crocodile under the bed. We have the chance to do something with Queens. I've, I've brought it round to Queens because the reason we keep coming back to Queens is because there's so many really good scientists here and there's a really lot of social, uh, social scientists here, medical people. Universities are going to need to be showing the world that they are relevant quickly. You do not want older scientists talking about yet another research scheme which you're going to put into the Wellcome Trust and we're going to be so excited to have another 30 people boring the arse off the world to discover something that we're going to 
be, make a big brouhaha of next year, and it will have changed nothing. I'm saying that simply because of my grandson, Luca. The reason I'm here is because you're so good. I would love us to make some hit records together where you actually crash departments together and say, you know what, we don't care. We're just going to sort this rivers problem. And the lawyers are going to help us do that. The engineers are going to get really excited. And you know what's going to be even better? Is that Queens is going to do something which is just not expected of it. It's going to hold out the friend, hands of friendship to all of the people who are working in the rivers, who are working on the farms, who are people who are, if you like, people who understand the music of machinery and that sort of thing, but may never have gone to university. Because it's an adventure so big that we've got to make it genuinely inclusive. That's what we want to do in Derry. But actually, we don't want to do it in Derry. We want to do it in Derry, but we want to do it in Ireland. We want to do it right across Ireland. We want to do it across Britain. And the whole world needs it. That's the thing. God, what a heavy speech this is. I normally make a lot of jokes. I don't know what's got into me. I'm, I, I, I'll get over it, sorry. Anyway, I was talking about the Wadawurung and the, the Mari Iwi, and we got this project in China, which is now two-thirds up. We've saved quarter of a million pounds in air flights because we haven't been able to go. So we got really, really used to just doing Zooms. Now, I don't know whether you know this. This is interesting. And if you don't know this, this may be something you want to look at. There is a company that is very, very cool that all of you hipsters will have heard of called Magic Leap. For those of you who haven't heard of Magic Leap, they're the, they're the company that's based out of Florida. They've got Disney and um, Jim Cameron have invested in them. Any of you have seen those pictures on the screen of a, 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 a humpback whale breaching in a school gymnasium or an elephant on someone's hand and the rest of it? That's, that's, that's who Magic Leap are. Magic Leap, when they went into um, lockdown, realized how many people were Zooming. And they started listening to what people were saying about Zoom and what the shortcomings were. And they realized that actually virtual reality is not nearly as popular as we think it might be. It's really strange. Us middle-aged fellas think it must be very, very attractive. But the youngsters actually don't, don't like that. It, it's because the pictures and those hats and all the rest of it, they're too close to your eyes. So your amygdala picks it up and it just immediately goes into fight or flight. So you don't relax into it. You know. Anybody who wants to have the experience of being the lead singer with Kasabian in a virtual reality experience, you're welcome, honestly. I, that's actually something my nightmares, but that's a different story. But, Anyway, sorry, this is interesting. I'll get around to the point of why it's interesting. It's interesting because Magic Leap decided to explore a technology that had sort of fallen slightly by the wayside, the holog hologrammatics, right? And they developed their, 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 hologram, their holograms so that they could actually use the screens. If you had the same glasses on either side of a place, you could walk through the screen and be in that space. Just get this, this is very cool. And if you've got the same headset on, you can turn around. So if you were working with the, uni as you were, I'm sure you do, the University of Osaka, you'll go, you just walk through the screen and you're there in Osaka. And you'll turn around and you've got some designs. You say, I like that, I don't like that, I don't like that. Don't give me a coffee, it won't, it'll go straight through me. You know? <laughs> no, but isn't that cool? And to prove it, three months ago, the chief executive of Magic Leap made a speech in Vienna, she was on stage, and she walked around. But she was in Florida. Just think about that for a moment. When I was telling you about a decentralized world and how the world is going to change, you add that to the factor. This is starting to become really interesting, isn't it, about you can do anything anywhere. Another company we're working with at the moment, it's quite interesting, we're working uh, it's a bit name droppy, but we're working with SpaceX. Um, well, one of our one of our trustees is working with tra SpaceX, who want to work with us, and the reason is because they're using these things called LEOs, uh, which are low altitude um, satellite sensing systems. Um, and the original idea was that you could then make people wherever they are in the world. It's like just here, it, you know. The, so they built the guy who's on our board has built stations out in the. Arctic, the far Arctic, he's bought a little island near Svalbard, and going right down Europe, and he goes down to uh, Ethiopia, and then goes all down the African coast down to South Africa. So this loopy, this loopy arc can go over, but if you include this technology of low um, 
low orbiting satellites with um, uh, 5G. At the moment, we, we're doing a 5G project at Eden, and it's actually really quite amazing what you can bring into a space. But when you see the potential of 6 and 7G, you will literally be able to walk at Eden, right? You'll be able to walk through a door and you'll be in a space, and in real time, all around you and sense around, you will be at our project in Costa Rica. You will be on our island in Aldabra, in the middle of the Indian Ocean, the most exotic island in the world, the best marine biodiversity of any country on Earth. And you can just dive under, under the sea on the ocean. You'll be able to see everything. And we can do that from our home in Derry or in Cornwall or, or actually in Schwalbad. The world will become ours. Don't you think that's going to really change the way we see the world and countries and politics and stuff? I think it's going to be amazing. There's some old hands that will need to die off, but it'll be good. Then the project in China is about cleaning water. That's why we want to have our rotter. It's, as, as I say, it's two-thirds finished. Um, we're doing, um, we've just finished the centerpiece of Dubai Expo 2020. And again, we went there with attitude. I say this not to be boastful. I say this because I think the time now is to be more bold, not to be same old, same old. The reason we built the centerpiece at Expo was that I was asked to be a critical friend for what was being built in the centerpiece. And <clears throat> Sheikh Mohammed's sister said, what do you think? And I said, can I speak freely? She said, has anything ever stopped you? I said, OK, it's shit. It's really shit. This is so bad what you've paid a lot of money, money for. And you know why it's so bad? You're pandering to the expectations of everybody else. You don't want to look as if you've somehow made a misstep. So you've got the same cliches of polar bears on ice cubes and diagrams of the weather system. And I said, this is so bad. So she said, what would you do? I said, I'd make it rock and roll. And it's also supposed to be for Expo, so there's going to be 26 million people going through it. You really think they're going to want to watch whiteboards with a little bit of an explanation of global heating? I don't think so. They're going to want to talk to each other. They're going to want to talk to their families. They've spent good money to be there. And you want them to leave in good theatrical terms with at least five memories they will never forget until the day they die. That's what all of this is about. We've got to see ourselves as the theater of education. It is pointless being the best and recognized by every other person who's like you in the world for being the best if the people who are in the middle of Ohio don't give a toss, isn't it? We've actually got to excite people everywhere. That it's, it's a commonality. It's a common journey. So that's what's really exciting us. We're, built, we're going to do something in the Amazon. The president of Colombia came to our stand at Expo, and he, um, he announced it. And at the same time, after, after he announced that we were doing this project together, he announced... Uh, that Colombia, you know, you know, 30 by 30, where by 2030, 30% 30 of your country will go to the wild. He said, we will do it with Eden next year. 30% of the wild preserved forever. Now, what's really cool about this, I will come back to Moral Compass, um, is what we're going to do. I cannot tell you how cool what we're going to do is. And we could do it here first. Everybody talks about 3D printing. Well, one of our partners is Bill McDonough, who those of you who are into the uh, building will know Bill McDonough is the god of construction. He wrote a book called Cradle to Cradle, which is the, the Bible of construction. 3D technology has made a huge advance over this last year. And there are some absolutely astonishing advances that have been made by accident. Bill has started experimenting with vegetable matter, all vegetable matter, desiccated, compressed. The problem with that is how do you get it to stick together and be strong? The guy, this is the reason for working with people who aren't at a university, right? They worked with a guy who worked in a timber mill who said, well, what? He, said, he, he made a joke. Anybody who can find a use for all this bloody lignin we've got coming out of our paper mill, um, uh, we'll give a reward to. And uh, so Bill said, well, let's try it with this stuff. It's brilliant. It's the ultimate resin for turning any vegetative matter into something that is like a glue lamb beam. Just think about it. You, you have a, let's just imagine, 
we persuade someone to put up enough money, you can do that, you know that. Um, a 3D printing press the size of this room, all vegetative material compressed, dehydrated, compressed with lignin. We can build everything we want out of waste materials. And it could look natural, be beautiful, and very, very strong. So the Colombians are very excited about that, but not half as excited as I am. I just love the idea that you use these technologies to suddenly, you know, we always say to kids who come to, our, uh, to, come to us, that remember there is no country called away. And that's part of our problem, isn't it? There is no country called away, so what do we do with all that waste? So that is something else we ought to be working on in Derry. Creating marvelous buildings that are on the front page of the Time, Time magazine that are made with a technology that excites everybody and they want to copy it. This is an agricultural country. We've got to brand agriculture as being cool and sexy and done by people who are really, really smart. Don't go down the English route. You're very lucky. When you get older, you might be able to work for the National Trust if you're very lucky. And, or maybe you could work for someone with a hedge fund and then toe the fall up. It drives me crazy. I'm a Dutchman by birth. In Holland, if you're, if you're a, a, in horticulture, it is a profession. It is high, more highly regarded than that of an accountant or a lawyer pretty much on a par with doctor, because you're growing marvelous stuff. In Britain, do you know who the leading provider of degrees in Britain today, tonight, is in horticulture? The Eden Project. When did we set up our university faculty? Three years ago. Why do they want to come to Eden? Because they like a place that has an arena that plays really good rock music. They like the fact that We've, it's a starry sort of thing. We teach them business. We teach them marketing. We teach them all the stuff that people need to be entrepreneurial. And they get to do cool stuff like grow experimental stuff. Again, we need to be doing that together. It's the future. I love my vanity. My vanity made me accept a position. I want you to show respect. I am on the Times Commission of Education. They think I know a thing or two. But you know, the really amazing thing about it is, and really nice people, I, I'm, I'm slightly taking the piss, right? But why is it you have, we live in a country where every single one of the experts on this commission, in private, agree that GCSE, GCSEs are the biggest joke in an education system? Why are we doing it? Why are we forcing young people to study, you know, History, like, we'll do Egyptians, World War I, and the Cold War. That's really helpful. We'll do that, yeah? It's really interesting. Do you think the people who thought that up ever thought about what an independent human maybe ought to know? I, I call me old-fashioned, but it would seem to me that in a disaster, knowing how to grow something might be number one. Number two might be how to cook something once you've grown it. Number three might be, we are in these amazing... Have you ever looked at your body? Have you? They're amazing things. How many kids know about their bodies? Oh, that's biology. How have we allowed something that's essential to our existential being to become a subject that you either study or you don't study? By the way, interrupting myself rudely, how dare I, if you want to give yourselves a real thrill, honestly, it is perhaps the most spiritual thing I have ever seen in my life. There is a photograph on the web, recently downloaded by CERN, you know, the Hadron Collider people, working with NASA of a single blood cell. Honestly, I've shown it to so many people and their jaws just drop. I blow it up like that by that. When you see the complexity of one human blood cell, it makes a Ferrari look like a Ford Fiesta. It is a thing of utter magic. And if everybody could have a chance of seeing that, they wouldn't put the crap that we all do into us. You would say, no, I want to nurture that blood cell. No, seriously, go home and look at it. And if you don't feel something go up the back of your spine, it doesn't matter whether you're religious or not, you soon will be when you watch that picture. It doesn't matter what religion, it's just religious, it's marvelous. So I'm sharing that with you, but the education thing you know, you're into, edu you're into education, aren't you? I've got to wind up now. She's agreeing that, that Queen's is into education. Um, 
it's just, it's just, it's just as well, isn't it? This, you know, that could have been so embarrassing. I was the wrong gig. Um, so anyway, moral compass, that's where we started. You may think I haven't been talking about business and the moral compass. I'm just taking as an assumption the following things. Humans are basically good. We've allowed a bunch of hoods to tell us that actually we're not to be trusted. Ask yourself a question why. The newspapers have one slogan. All tabloid newspapers, the same slogan. If it bleeds, it leads. We will tell you the bad stories. It is safer today than it's ever been. People are as kind as they ever were. How have we persuaded ourselves that we're such rotten scoundrels? We're not. We're a marvelous species, completely capable of grabbing this by the throat and actually getting a big win out of it. And going up to COP and before that the G7, I, I, this is quite a sort of funny thing to say, but you know what? I felt incredibly close to the people who are in charge of these big companies and seeing that kind of an over, what is it, the cynicism of the unworldly where you suspect people's motives for everything is just inappropriate. I think we are at a very interesting time culturally and the best thing we can do is to suspend our disbelief about people's motives but also remember to be angry at any who would seem to wish to be part of this establishment who are treasonous. By treasonous, I mean the moral compass should not allow any business to poison our water, to poison our air, or to turn our soils into desiccated nonsense. I doubt there's a person in this room that would disagree with that. So part of the job here, and our friends at KPMG, I know socially we talked about it earlier, the, the, the whole push of the future is going to be to actually make people who are brave in their exercise of their moral conscience, conscience not feel as if they're somehow suspect in the business community. They should be held up and heroized because it's the age of the stakeholder being equal to the shareholder. That's all I wanted to say about the moral compass. I'm sorry I've gone on, and I'm sorry there were no jokes. I'm going to really beat myself up after this, so I apologize. Thank you for listening to me. What a fabulous lecture. No doubt we could have listened for, for another hour and more, but um, I think we want to have enough, give enough time for some questions, and no doubt there are plenty of questions. It's such a mix of, of optimism and passion, uh, and yet clouded with a little bit of pessimism around the political system and the relationships with the, the big corporates, particularly the oil companies. But maybe let's, I, I wonder, do you want to respond to that while we see what, um, if anybody has got a question in the audience? Can we start with that one, Tim? Yeah. Maybe it's because I'm an old fart, uh, and I, I, I'd be really interested in the answers of other, other people. Let me talk, this sounds like a funny thing to say, let me talk as a man. One of the problems you get with men is that we're actually, we may be physically strong, but um, we're emotionally pretty pathetic. And what happens is, when you become a member of the establishment, it's so hard won, you then somehow can't find the reason to say the hard thing. You don't want to be excluded. And that happens everywhere. That happens everywhere. And I think one of the things that, I think 2008 started this with the, if you like, the betrayal of the, the public by the banks. But I think, um, you know, I don't know whether you care to comment in a minute, but I think an awful lot of people who are in that establishment now, as of, I mean, now, today, are starting to get ready for a, 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 a seismic change where they no longer want to call those who are in the commercial world, generally, you're one of us. And I think what you're going to see is a lot of big companies that have got this moral compass actually starting to cut out of their lives the companies that haven't got that. That's what I've witnessed. I don't know. Is that your experience? So he's saying something very interesting. Do you mind saying that again? Yeah. <laughs> I was just saying that in the last couple of years, I mean, obviously just responding to what we're hearing in discussions with, with clients and 
and context is just you know responding to the stakeholders the kind of the, the change and sort of the maybe the moral compass a little bit right and um, and kind of looking for support uh, in, in all of these things as well so I think it's absolutely driving I think the the, the agenda of many CEOs it's it's certainly uh, dictating lots of our agendas in terms of discussions um, it's it's resulted in us probably two years ago taking a decision to form our own kind of dedicated sort of climate climate change you know sustainable futures um, team as well and, and you know it's enormous appetite um, to, to talk to them as well so I think it resonates with what you're saying now thanks for that thanks so that was my bit come on have you any of you got any questions I mean you know this is he do you know how embarrassing it is to sit here and the boss has just said, any, you must all have a question, and no one has a question. I feel this big. Please. This question. Mine's not really a question, and I'm very unprepared for it, but um, you talk so much about localized farming and a provincial um, approach, and um, you asked how do we prepare people locally for that. And I guess I've been hearing a lot about true cost accounting, where that which is easy to produce locally, benefits us all, and should be very low cost, and that which it sh is very damaging should be higher cost, and I just wondered how do we prepare locally for that, and how do we prepare societally, and how do we prepare politically for true cost accounting? Well, that's a great question. Um, the way we're looking at it at Eden is that we, we want to see how much of what we consume could be grown or made or produced where we are. Because the strange thing is that every pound you spent outside your region is a hemorrhage of wealth from where you are going somewhere else. Um, and the interesting thing with the technology, the interesting thing that technology is going to start providing us with is the ability to grow relatively small amounts of things, to, uh, but in series. Um, and what we're hoping to achieve at, 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 uh, at Eden is 365 days of the year variety. I don't know whether any of you have ever heard of a guy called Pete Seger. Pete Seger, he, he, he has a farm. He's, he became a multimillionaire through organic farming. And he is the best horticulturist I've ever met. And on 17 acres, he grows, I think, 78 crops. But, I mean, there isn't a minute that there isn't stuff being grown. And he's, what he says is that the problem we have with horticulture and agriculture is, um, there are others in this room more capable than I of answering this, but I, I'll, I'll have a stab and then be corrected, is that it is what is called a wicked problem. And a wicked problem is where the solution is not lying in one silver bullet. It is in a series of steps. So um, what Pete would say is, there are three problems with large-scale horticulture and agriculture, uh, uh, mixed agriculture. The first is that Britain has invested bizarrely heavily in distribution centers up the A1 corridor because it, it, it's anticipating importing so much from the continent and from Holland. Number two is its colleges are so poor that there's no entrepreneurial spirit in agriculture and horticulture. Of course, there are individual examples, but I mean, as a, as a whole. And the third thing is the way we have neglected the, uh, the inner sanctum of the, the towns and villages of our country means that we haven't got proper market spaces in which the habit of markets can be reintroduced, which actually create a whole load of social well-being as you go, because once you've got those marketplaces, you can then uh, create local distribution uh, networks to make sure that you know Monday is this town, Tuesday is that town, and the evidence shows that when it's properly done, so that it's not like tokenism, you'll suddenly find that you know a barber will move to town, an accountant will suddenly set up an office, and so you see these things just growing. We were talking, we were talking earlier about the city of Nantes in the Loire, which to me is the most inspirational town I've ever been to in terms of how it pulled itself up by its bootstraps. But you've got to bear in mind, you are living in one of the most beautiful parts of Europe. And I think very often people who live here forget that, how beautiful it is, how precious it is. And you have got great agriculture. And I think a sense of independence within Northern Ireland to grow that which Northern Irish uh, people would eat, but also uh, will cater for all the tourists to make it a huge food experience. And then you start adding up the tonnage of what you do. Then you start to look at the add-on stuff of, you know, growing 
the varieties. Again, f forgive me, I know you know about this stuff, but you grow the einkorn and the spelt and the whatever in small amounts so that if you have a bad winter, you don't get ruined. But collectively, you then find someone to put in the money to, bu to build a damned mill or a malt house. Part of the problem with farming all over Britain is that the infrastructure is not affordable by any one farm particularly, especially small farms. So we've got to actually work out a way of collectivizing. Now that is why, um, like our friends from KPMG, are, are really, really valuable. If you start to create a project that you can get your teeth into, you know, how can we create a localized agriculture food industry that is sustainable? And then you analyze what is missing, how do we afford to put that in, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think that's a very sexy thing to do. Then when you add, add in what I said earlier about um, renewable energy, once you've got renewable energy available to you that does not cost the earth and give you a flexibility, you can then grow things um, that are really niche. But the internet, the weirdest thing about the internet is you can, on the internet, you can buy dates from a particular town in Morocco, which are very famous, right? But no one would ever have thought of advertising them before. Do you know what the market size is for cognac from Armenia? You don't, do you? Shame on you. No, but, the, but think about it. This is really exciting. It means you can grow niche things, and with the internet, if it's properly run, you can create markets. You can be a market maker, which will mean that farmers can be, can be far more independent. The last problem you have is farmers, um, by which a lot of time spent on their own, in a lot of farms, leads to a sort of madness. Um, and I'm not making a joke, it does. It does lead to a sort of madness, that loneliness, that crushing fear of defeat. Is, it, it does something to you. And it's no, no uh, mistake that a lot of um, men and women who are farmers seriously suffer from well-being issues to do with that and the feeling that they don't know, you know what's going to go. And I think um, getting farmers to collaborate together has always been difficult. It has always been difficult. I don't know, it's not to do distrust, it's that fierce, they're like in, independent frontiersmen. All I would say is, look on the internet, yeah, for, um, what are they called? Uh, the, the huge, the huge, uh, um, I've gone outside me, the huge cooperative, cooperative um, Mon, um, Mondragon, Mondragon, in the Basque country of Spain. It's the biggest cooperative in the world. It's so cool. It is just, I think, the coolest, the coolest organization. 99 companies, 2.7 billion pounds sterling turnover, and it's just explosive. They've got their own hospital, their own university, and oddly, 99 companies. But look them up, everybody, because the future structure of business itself, I think we're going to be exploring a lot more different types. We've been carrying on our shoulders, you know, the limited liability company for a long time, and we've seen certain structures like community interest companies emerge, um, uh, certain kite marks, if you like, like B Corp and stuff like that. But I think there's a lot further to go, again, your territory. But I, I think that the whole thing about what would a modern cooperative look like that gives people independence yet magnetism to be able to jointly and severally negotiate within the market, I think is going to be really, really interesting going forward. Sorry, that was a bit of a long-winded argument, but, it, but a, a conversation. But I think it's just such an important question, and it's important for everybody's livelihoods going forward. Any questions? Yes. I thought all of the money in Nod came out of slavery, actually. We'll talk about that later, OK? You know, but you're talking about massive changes in the global food supply system. It is the most complex system we have on this planet. Change is going to be unbelievably difficult. Now, I have visited lots of farms here in Northern Ireland and farms across the world. Farmers are setting out, A, to do the right thing, OK? B is to try to keep their families in existence. And you know, if you have a crop failed, you know, in, in India, you know, the massive number of suicides now because yeah. of crop failure there. So how do you start to unpick such a complex system and really bring about that change? That that's the bit that I just don't get. 
how are we going to change the thoughts of millions of farmers? How many pepper farmers are there in Vietnam? You like to ask questions. How many is there? Flipping out. Uh, well, I'll swap you the answer to that question with the origin of Hocus Pocus. <laughs> How are you going to change a million people from the way they do things at the moment to make sure that they produce the pepper to sell into the world's market? 80% of all the world's pepper comes from Vietnam. Did you know that? So Hi. it's all of these different things. You know, I can talk about 80% of the world's almonds come from California, 80% of garlic comes from China. How are you going to start to affect those changes? Because they are selling into the big markets and they're doing it at the minimum amount of price. So it would be lovely to say in Northern Ireland, we're going to convince every farmer to grow a little bit of garlic, a little bit of this. The markets have to change dramatically. So what's going to affect that change? Um, look, I mean, that's, you were my friend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, look, crikey, we've talked many a night about this. I can't get my head around world markets. I can tell you a trivial story which gives some clue. As you know, we have a big project in Costa Rica of 10,000 acres, um, which was previously 42 derelict farms. Uh, and over the last 30 years, it's become a most incredible rainforest. Where there was no water, there are now four rivers running 365 days a year. We have, um, six months ago, we've signed a contract with our friends at Hotel Chocolat. And we're going to colonize our rainforests with wild cacao using the local villagers who will own the cacao. And the profit from that uh, chocolate that comes from the rainforest will go to be buying more and more land to create wider and wider biodiversity corridors. It is very interesting, our relationship with Paquera, which is the town nearest us with 8,000 souls, it is almost for them a spiritual thing to have seen a place where the people were being murdered every year because it was five to six months drought. Now there's no drought, there's water all the time. And <clears throat> I was saying to the students today that when, you, when the mayor gets up and he says, do you know what it felt like to look up at the high mountains and see the shimmering in the distance because you knew the drought was coming, there was just heat, heat, heat. And now that shimmering is mist turning into rain and then the rain falls. It's like the second coming of Christ. And I think part of our job is to create stories in which we can take one area at a time. I, I cannot get my head around global agriculture. However, I have the sense that if we can show great practice in a few places, the world is full of smart people. We don't need to do it all. We just allow those chains to bond to each other in a way that enables it to grow. And that thing about food security, I don't know what the future is going to bring, but sure as hell, this sounds a bit hippie-ish. It is a bit hippie-ish. The gap between poor and rich is so great, so great now, that that mediation of that has got to include the protection of our fellow citizens who are engaged in actions that, that are potentially risky, growing food for us. There's got to be a social contract there. You know, I, 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 and I think what's happened with the siloing is that we've dehumanized ourselves a bit and haven't realized there is a social contract between us all that if you're going to grow this for me and you have a bad year, we'll make sure that you still get paid and we've got to work out clever ways of doing that. You're quite right, it's complex. But the interesting other thing is the degree to which you can create a mixed economy where you've now got single crop concentrations. Um, almonds being an interesting one. I mean, we go to California a lot, oddly, to the Sequoia Crest. Um, and when you drive past these, these, these things and you think, what part of the word effing bonkers is this? We're growing cheap almonds using unbelievably precious water to the point the water table is going down and down and down. All I would say, I don't think there's going to be cheap water for long. So I would be talking to the Vietnamese about why don't you grow almonds? And I'm, I don't mean that as a joke, actually. I, I think that's where your expertise, where a university can be really ahead of a game in terms of planning. Um, that was a boring 
evasive thing. Do you want to know the hocus pocus? Okay. This is useless information. Everybody needs a piece of hocus pocus. The word hocus pocus for magic comes from the Middle Ages when peasants went to see the priest doing, you know, uh, this is bread that is your flesh and so on. What he said in Latin, or she, that was always he then, right, was hoc est corpus. And the peasants in the front row were going, fucking magic. And that's how it happened. Well, that went down badly, didn't it? I just, <laughs> Did you all know that already? That, that has to be the explanation, I think. That's a tired joke in this, <laughs> this corner. Tim, I, I think we're going to have to, unfortunately, draw it to a close. Um, fascinating uh, talk from you tonight um, and really enjoyable. You mentioned it um, during your talk about the expo uh, and inspiring them to have five things that people would go away and never forget. I think you've given us many more than five things and things that we will reflect on um, when we're lying in bed tonight and, and things come back to us of, of what you've said. You don't have all the answers. You're not expected to have all the answers, but what you most definitely have is the vision um, for what we can be. We can be a better society. We can be better individuals. Uh, and we can actually uh, leave a better uh, inheritance to the children and grandchildren that come after us. But so can we build an AI otter? Well, we're working on that one. We're working on that one. So um, can I just thank you? And I would like to pass over now to Johnny Hanna, who is the, the managing partner at KPMG, for a vote of thanks to you. I don't have a microphone, so I'll have to do the, the old lectern. Um, so I mean, again, just to kind of reiterate all this comment. It was a really fascinating um, discussion. Look forward to the AI. Otter, uh, I, you've summarized, I think, some of the key points um, kind of really well. There's a couple of things that's, that struck me. One is I have to think about rebranding our center of excellence. That was, the, that was, the, that was definitely one, one very important takeaway. Um, I, mean, I, I think we touched earlier in terms of in, in the Q&A around what we're seeing. And you know, certainly in, in the last number of years, there, there's clearly a bit of a groundswell, right? So we talk about kind of mobilizing people and, and certainly there's a mobilization in, in, the, in the corporate world and I think it's responding to regulators, it's responding to their own people. Um, you know, and we, and we see that and I think, I don't know if it was Chris mentioned 80%, I think that 85% of corporate, you know, global emissions is coming from the corporate world, right? And, and you saw a little bit of that in COP26 this week where I think there were some positives, um, you know, 100 odd, 130 odd countries who've kind of signed a, a climate pledge versus 20 only two years ago, so there's clearly momentum. Um, you know, and I think, and I think that's, that's really, really positive, right? And it's something that, you know, I think we all have to be kind of aspire to. You touched also, I think, in the earlier part of your discussion around cities of the future and towns, and I think that certainly gives, I think, everyone in this room, certainly been Queens and the city councils and, and government departments food for thought in terms of some of the planning as well. So, so look, it was fascinating stuff. Uh, I know it was recorded, so I, I, I hope you, you sent a link to all the schools. Uh, and kids around, and, and I say this again, just to thank you very much for, for uh, coming along um, for a really engaging uh, conversation, and I say thank you all.